everyone. Um, so welcome to the 2023-2024 uh, Endocrine Grand Round Series. Uh, we are very happy to kick this off. Um, uh, as usual, post Labor Day is when we start our Grand Rounds. We'll run through um, the end of the academic year. Uh, and we, as usual, have a long list of um, speakers lined up, and I'm sure all of you will uh, enjoy the different presentations. And uh, also, as is customary, uh, I start off the presentations for the year. And uh, before that, I would like to thank all the people who uh, help put these things together, uh, particularly from uh, the um, molecular endocrine perspective of um, Carrie Kling and uh, Copper Wintergers for uh, arranging the pediatric endocrine topics. And we have some good outside speakers who will come um, over the next year to give us some uh, talks. So today I thought I will uh, talk about this topic of obesity because you know we are hearing a lot about it. And um, the thing about turning the tide on obesity, uh, exploring the causes of obesity and the role of glucagon. So I kind of uh, combined some things which are very um, contemporary in terms of very recent publications uh, this month or um, you know uh, last month that there were publications on this topic, including the title about are we turning the tide on obesity was a, a one-page editorial in Science uh, last month. You know? So um, <clears throat> I have no conflicts to declare. So I'm going to review some of the understanding of the uh, complexity of the causes of obesity, discuss some hypotheses that try to explain the causes of obesity, and then I'll talk about glucagon because that now is kind of one of the new kids on the block for the treatment of obesity. Also, because it turned 100 years, you know, a couple of years ago, we talked about insulin, which was 100 years, um, and now it's glucagon's turn. And we will look at glucagon receptor agonism uh, in obesity and how that could play a role, and particularly uh, with the um, dual agonists, agonists and um, triple agonists, uh, which are being uh, studied in phase two and phase three uh, clinical trials. <clears throat> So, just to give you a background, this is from the World um, Obesity uh, Foundation's uh, data, and this really is talking about what will happen, you know, uh, the way the uh, um, obesity uh, epidemic or pandemic is going on. Um, the, it's expected about 58% of the U.S. population will be obese by uh, 2035. And I just wanted to contrast it with Japan, where it is still going to be 8%, which is like an extremely low uh, rate of um, obesity. You know? um, and also when you look at the cost, so um, right now in 2020, it's about $312 billion a year, and that is going to go up, um, that's the healthcare cost. Uh, and that will go up to 467 billion by 2035. And so, you know, but again, at the same time in Japan, they're turning 27, uh, sorry, it's about $19 billion uh, now, and it'll be $27 billion by 2035. So it has a huge uh, healthcare impact. It has huge economic impact. Um, and so there is something that is um, <clears throat> to be un better understood and so we had to figure out um, what what to do with this problem. How can we um, manage this? So I what I did was, you know, I, I recently read this um, series of articles, uh, which I found very interesting. So I have included them, um, almost all of them, not uh, in in my presentation. And I was telling Doctor, um, you know, um, that we were going to. This is going to be like an extended journal club part of it because I'm going to uh, describe, um, present some of the uh, articles that were 
published um, in the last um, month uh, in the transactions of the philosophical, uh, the Royal Philosophical, uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So this is based on a um, three-day symposium that was arranged in London, uh, which explored the causes of obesity, uh, and um, several experts in the field presented there. And you can see here, uh, this is the preface, and this itself was very interesting in the sense that, it, first of all, it talks about, uh, unlike other diseases whose causes are generally appreciated, to have complex etiologies. Um, so obesity seems you know, very simple, most likely to be viewed as having a simple and obvious cause. So it's attributed to gluttony or in sloth, to of the canonical seven deadly sins, and that's historically cast as a result of moral failure of righteous uh, willpower. So that has been the case. Even when we knew about the signs of obesity, it was also very simple. Uh, it was the equation of energy input versus energy output. So it's very simple. You just have to uh, take in less energy and put out more energy and everything will be fine. But you know, while that itself is um, uh, fairly simple, um, it, we come to appreciate that the control of these things um, is quite complex, which is what makes management of this problem um, very complicated. So um, the data regarding long-term regulation of food intake and energy expenditure uh, is you know, very spotty. So um, unlike other diseases, you know, most people get their opinion on this based on anecdotal experiences you know, rather than expertise or evidence or thing. You know, they'll tell you that so-and-so did this so they lost weight or so-and-so did this and they gained weight. So that's their theory of how uh, somebody gains weight or loses weight. So it has to be, um, you know, explored in a more detailed way. And so uh, even in the scientific field, there is a lot of uh, room for more questioning um, because some of the theories that we had, and that has become quite obvious with the GLP-1 and now glucagon related um, interventions, because these are not things that from the physiology that we knew we would have expected that these drugs would actually cause weight loss, and not at least to the extent that to which they have been causing it. That means we have to rethink the whole as to what is uh, going on. So, um, and they quote this thing that the most exciting phrase to hear in science um, is not eureka, but that's funny because that's when you talk thinking about you know because if you're taking thinking that glucagon will raise blood sugar, um, why is it making you lose weight, you know? Uh, or what is it doing to appetite? So that is where you go and try to explore the cause of the problem. And that's how, you know, you investigate uh, things. So <clears throat> I won't go through all of them, but I'll go through about six or seven different aspects of um, weight regulation and theories of obesity uh, which were presented and um, get an idea just to get an idea that there's a whole range of problems that need to be um, uh, evaluated before we can really understand uh, even to a superficial degree what exactly the problem is. So the first thing I will talk about is the fructose survival hypothesis. You know? So this is a theory that says that um, that obesity and metabolic disorders may have developed from overstimulation of an evolutionary based biologic response that aims to protect animals in advance of crisis. So it is characterized by hunger, thirst, foraging, weight gain, fat accumulation, insulin resistance, systemic inflammation, increased blood pressure. So these are things which are thought to be something that has immediate survival benefit. So that, you know, if you put it in overdrive and it remains in that way, will cause some long-term consequences, which 
cause cardiovascular disease and other things. So, so what is very good for the immediate uh, survival response is not good in the long term. So um, this can be by, you know, by ingestion of fructose or by stimulating endogenous fructose production by the polyol pathway. And uh, fructose reduces active energy in the cell while blocking its regeneration from fat. So I'll show you that in a diagram. And um, this happens through, um, you know, by intracellular uric acid, mitochondrial oxidative stress, inhibition of AMP kinase, stimulation of vasopressin. And then the uh, mitochondrial oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation is suppressed and glycolysis is stimulated. So this aim to be modest and short-lived, the response in human is exaggerated uh, due to gain of thrifty genes, coupled with a Western diet rich in foods that contain or generate fructose. So, you know, um, when you look at that, this is the normal weight regulation pathway. That means, you know, you're isocaloric, you're maintaining your ADP fat stores and balance. So in a hypercaloric state, you know, um, there is an increase in fat, a, a decrease in ATP, but then, you know, there is a self-correction that occurs and the opposite happens uh, here. Now, in the fructose survival pathway, what you're having is that you are not going to, you're going to reduce the ATP, this increased energy intake, you know, there is leptin resistance as a result, and you get more fat accumulated uh, and, you know, the, because there is, you, know, you have to generate more uh, ATP. So there is a balance that is eventually reached, but then it ends up with higher amounts of uh, body fat. And this can occur with either um, endogenous um, pathways or exogenous pathway by which you can generate the, the fructose. So, you know, the foods that is like including high glycemic index carbohydrates, salty foods, alcohol, um, foods, uh, beer, you know, th these things all tend to you know, activate the fructose pathway. And that in turn, uh, over time, leads to um, development of um, uh, more fat. And, and this is a, a more detailed uh, thing as to how uh, fructose does this, um, as to what it does in terms of the immediate energy requirements and how this actually blocks the pathway and lowers the ATP levels inside the cell, which then increases hunger, increases food intake, uh, weight gain, fat synthesis, and accumulation of insulin resistance, uh, dyslipidemia, and BP. So eventually it will restore the ATP levels, but at that time it is done at the expense of more uh, accumulation of fat. So that is the, the hypothesis that has been there. Uh, and, you know, there are many, uh, uh, you know, lines of evidence that does that. So you have preferentially store fat over glycogen um, through a bit with fructose, which is a survival uh, nutrient. It helps conserve energy, you know. Um, it does maintain key bodily functions, um, and, you know, it does activate the immune system. Um, so while these are all, as I said, these are all good for the short term, they are bad for the long term. Helps find food and water by stimulating hunger and, uh, and thirst. Um, so there's this mechanism that is there that uh, leads to more uh, fat. So we have adopted foods that activate this switch in our everyday diet and coupled with thrifty genes we picked up, we're now suffering the consequences of putting the survival pathway in overdrive. So, um, so the question is, you know, how do we address this? Um, we don't know. Of course, one obvious thing is, yes, you can eat, consume less fructose. <laughs> uh, so, um, like with you know uh, all the soft drinks and other things that we have, um, which have high fructose corn syrup and things like that. But also, you know, reducing stress and these also have uh, have the same uh, effect. You know, so so those are things that we have to. Um, address and and is there a shortcut i mean that's what we are always looking for 
Is there a way to deal with it better than uh, just diet and things? The second theory that they looked at was natural selection and um, human adiposity. So crafty genotype and thrifty phenotype. So uh, this is kind of a, a thing where we have turned, heard of the thrifty genotype, but um, the they wanted to talk about crafty genotype because you know there is a certain way by which the um, genes that regulate um, body weight and eventual survival um, are uh, break, uh, no, are uh, altered, you know, which helps survival. You know? So the main thing is, you know, there, there are uh, genome-wide association studies looking at multiple genes that are associated with obesity. But in this case, what you're looking at is, you know, um, there's a strong selection on lower and upper limits of adiposities with negligible fitness implications uh, of for in, intermediate obesity I mean, adiposity. You know, so when you look at it, in fact, what you find is that most of the genes that you're uh, looking at are either related to extreme obesity or very thin uh, individuals. So in between this range that we have, you know, we actually don't know much about uh, what happens, you know. So the the question here is, you know, um, about what happens when you have, you know, uh, volatile environments where in, there is a you know, changing amount of um, uh, energy that is uh, available. So to keep that stable, you know, you have to uh, adjust for it through both genetic and phenotypic variations. So um, then also there is this question about um, body composition you know, in terms of peripheral versus abdominal uh, fat depots. Um, so there is a prioritization of uh, survival versus uh, reproduction, which also comes, you know, they address the issue of gender, you know, uh, as to why subcutaneous fat uh, and peripheral fat is more uh, in females versus uh, males who tend to have more uh, central fat, you know. So um, <clears throat> you can accomplish um, longevity by undernutrition. Abdominal fat will actually have some immediate survival and fitness benefits while long-term metabolic risks uh, become higher. So, so what you have here is, you know, uh, that is this cycle of, um, you know, uh, colonizing new places, exploiting new niche, then exposed to novel stresses, evolution of greater plasticity, cope with ecologic, ecologic variability. So this cycle is continuous uh, through human evolution. When people move from one place to another, um, you know, there is this constant thing. And when you, and, and we see that even Today, when people move from one country to another and their diets are different or their activities are different, there are differences in both uh, adiposity and also in uh, cardiovascular uh, risk uh, that is there. So there is both natural selection and gender selection that occurs. You know? And these occur at different uh, levels. Um, and you know, like they address issues with famine, seasonality, social stress, epidemics, um, like we saw with um, the you know, um, with uh, COVID, you know, which is the reverse of what usually would have happened, you know, with infectious disease, people actually would have lost weight, you know, uh, reproductive uh, for sexual selection, climate. So this is this whole thing. And then you have at the individual level, you have all these uh, things uh, through different stages of life. And then you have, you know, uh, within the individual different organs and um, metabolic pathways that are uh, uh, altered. So, and then there is the behavioral susceptibility theory. So um, where, you know, um, it is the role of um, appetite in genetic susceptibility to obesity in early life. So, so this theory says that excess weight gain during early years, in particular rapid weight gain in the first two years of life, are major risk factors for adult obesity. And here, um, our pediatric colleagues would be very uh, familiar with this type of uh, of uh, you know, topic, uh, where the 
the complex interaction between gene and environment because uh, there are genetic factors that determine the uh, appetite and food intake and uh, besogenic environment and other behaviors. Uh, but at the same time, um, there, is a, there are environmental factors. So, but there is so much variance um, that is seen that, you know, there's still not clear as to how the two will interact, how the genetic factors and environmental factors early in childhood actually determines what happens to them uh, when they are uh, adults. So um, that is another area that is of uh, significant import. So you have environmental and genetic factors that regulate appetite, which then in turn have metabolic uh, factors that control satiety and um, regulate satiety hormones. Uh, and social factors and food availability, then positive energy balance and weight gain. Then this looks at uh, different individuals. There is high genetic susceptibility to obesity. Then you have food supply. So depending on different factors, the actual uh, percentage of obesity. So if you have high genetic susceptibility and abundant food, you'll get very high rates of obesity. Um, and you have all these intermediate things, but there certainly is a lot of variation in, in these. So what about cognitive processes in the development of uh, obesity in humans? You know, um, there are a lot of uh, studies that look at the ability, the, the, the association between cognitive function and obesity, and it works both ways. That means that, you know, um, the question of uh, decrease in cognitive uh, ability and weight gain, is it the cause or effect is somewhat difficult to uh, delineate, you know, because um, metabolic syndrome and uh, Western diet uh, does alter brain structure and cognitive function. So is that what is, you know, kind of perpetuating uh, this problem? But there is evidence to show both in humans and animals that um, decreased cognitive function actually uh, increases um, food intake uh, and decreased physical activity and therefore weight gain. So uh, that is one of the uh, factors that may play into this whole thing. Then you have body composition issues, that is fat-free mass and resting metabolic rates are determinants of energy intake. Um, so, um, most of us would think that fat mass determines uh, energy intake, but it's actually fat free mass that determines um, how, you know. So, the higher the fat free mass, the higher the amount of uh, energy intake that is there. Fat mass actually has the opposite effect uh, of decreasing energy. So that's the normal uh, regulation you know, that is there. You know. um, so, that, um, you know, the, the models of appetite control um, you know, has to be you know, developed, which will incorporate these and see whether exercise or something might actually, you know, how it might play into this whole system. So, you know, this is a complex neuronal circuitry integrating physiologic inputs and outputs. So what you have here is that physical activity uh, has both acute and long-term effects. So it has effects on body composition itself because it will increase uh, fat-free mass, uh, which increases resting metabolic rate, which then has a tonic uh, energy demand and drive to eat. You know. um, and then you have fat mass, which um, uh, with leptin and other uh, adipokines, you have a tonic inhibition of energy intake um, with complex, no, and it also, uh, exercise also has effects on gastrointestinal physiology and, you know, gastrointestinal hormones, which regulate uh, appetite, including CCK, GLP-1, ghrelin, uh, PYRI. So there's episodic signals uh, and biomarkers that are there. Um, so there is this uh, complicated relationship between um, body composition and um, energy intake. So when you look at that, now fat-free mass uh, has most of its effects through 
it's rest resting metabolic rate. No. So its effect on energy intake is largely through what it does to resting metabolic rate and some effect which is direct. And then you have uh, fat mass which can work both directly and also uh, indirectly through um, energy, you know, uh, eating behavior. So this is a questionnaire uh, which uh, is the Dutch eating behavior questionnaire. So um, this has its effect on uh, resting uh, on uh, energy intake uh, through the eating behavior. So uh, so this is a complex interaction between your body composition itself and uh, weight uh, regulation. The other thing that is uh, is about maternal obesity. You know? So what is the early impact life impacts of maternal obesity? Um, so that is, you know, again, um, currently the number of uh, pregnancies, which is complicated by obesity um, in developing countries, more than 50% of pregnancies are in women who are overweight or have obesity. And associated with increased risk of many adverse outcomes, uh, for both the mother and the baby uh, during a pregnancy and at birth. But the long term, that is the that maternal obesity before and during pregnancy associated with increased risk of cardiometabolic disease uh, later in life. So um, now looking at siblings discordant for uh, in vitro exposure to maternal obesity suggests it's not a simple uh, thing due to transmission of obesogenic genes between mother and child or current lifestyle, but are affected by intrauterine environment on fetal development. So there are long term consequences of exposure to maternal obesity during development of uh, cardiometabolic uh, health of the offspring. So you have both, you know, genetic effects, environmental effects and early life environment. Uh, leading to eventual cardiometabolic risk. And within this here, you have altered development and functional uh, or, and function of food intake pathways occurring in utero, congenital heart defects, hypertrophy, hypertension, uh, and increased risk of these uh, for the fetus. And then you have epigenetic changes uh, that alter gene expression, which eventually could uh, lead to permanent changes um, in the offspring and also in the uh, mother. So, uh, you know, weight during pregnancy is another uh, major uh, area of uh, interest. And then you have the external environment. So, you know, um, these are all more difficult to, to study, uh, use epidemiological trackable uh, measures uh, that are proxies for uh, energy balance or macronutrient composition intake. So um, most of the things that I've looked at uh, are the built environment and the food environment. Uh, these are considered the most uh, important ones to, to look at. And the external environments are in flux at this point um, with changing urban form, social environment, and everybody sitting on the web uh, and, um, you know, uh, networking and online uh, activity. So you have, you know, the environment, which is bodily environment. The focus here is on fat deposition in humans or rodent organisms. These are physiologic processes. Um, gene environment interactions and epigenetics can be uh, looked at. These are different approaches. Then you have familial things where you're looking um, at population obesity in child, children and adolescents. Energy intake and in, uh, output can be you know, measured, and you can study those. Uh, institutional food services, and then you have population obesity with energy intake and uh, expenditure being studied. So, um, and these are um, urban planning you know, issues that are being studied. So you have this, you know, there's the built environment and the food environment. You have the uh, ecology, uh, biologics and things and climate uh, that is uh, around. This is the larger environment that we have. And then you have the family and institutional and the social web. And then you have, um, you know, the uh, social behavior, uh, culture, politics, economics, all of these play into this. And then you go down to the uh, person, self, individual, and then you have the physiologic level. So uh, these are 
multiple layers which are being addressed. So if we want to break down these things, um, the continued global increase in the prevalence of obesity. Um, you now, as I said, you know, the conference was held last year. So what we have is that um, it, it, there have been advances in the biological understanding of the biology and physiology of weight gain and maintenance. Um, there is considerable you know, lack of information as to exactly what happens. So, so the first thing is that the consensus was reached that obesity is enough, not a reflection of diminished willpower, but rather complex, um, multiple complex factors. And I think that is often a difficult thing for patients to uh, understand. We, they think that we are really judgmental when tell them to do one thing or the other. The um, accumulated evidence suggests that continued focus primarily on individual contributors with suboptimal will be suboptimal in promoting weight management at a population level. The reason I say that is because whatever we have, whatever medications we give are all at an individual level. And, you know, I'll come to that briefly in the next slide. And, you know, we need to consider um, biologics and physiologic processes within the broader context of social demographic and sociocultural exposures as well as environmental changes to optimize research priorities and public health efforts. So you should have system level approaches so uh, so that there are both systemic and group specific uh, environmental determinants um, that often serve as barriers to otherwise efficacious prevention and treatment options. So this is a huge problem um, because we know uh, that you know, when we try to address this at a larger scale, uh, we don't have the resources or the structure to address this. So this was the um, article that was published uh, last month uh, in Science Editorial. Said here, turning the tide on obesity. Okay. And that's why I chose this topic to talk about. So here it says, more than a billion people worldwide have obesity and many more are overweight. With emergence of new, highly effective weight loss drugs, might the fat decades become a closed chapter in the history of public health? So that was a quite a bold statement. And I think, I think that uh, GLP-1 analogs will be forever. People will be born with, you know, with a GLP-1 pump or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't look like that, you know. But uh, <laughs> Uh, the prevalence of obesity steadily advanced, uh, disproportionately affecting uh, marginalized racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic communities. In 2022, the World uh, Obesity Foundation predicted that the global economic impact of overweight and obesity will be uh, 4.32 million trillion uh, by 2035. So it's a pretty expensive thing. So will now, obviously, we have this GLP-1 and, G and GIP, GLP uh, combination drugs, you know. Will these blockbuster drugs turn the global tide? And if so, for everyone or just an advantaged few? So the talk about it's a boon for pharma, you know, but a challenge for patients in that lost weight is regained when you stop the medication. So. Um, that's, you know, uh, these are forever drugs. You can't stop them. So, well, well so that's not the solution to the problem. Uh, what are the risks of taking these drugs for life? We don't know that. Um, does habituation occur? Will they dissuade people from regular exercise, which carries distinctive health benefits? So those are all questions. In addition to some of the issues that are related to how you know, uh, other aspects of how uh, weight loss itself might affect overall uh, behavior and uh, health. So, so we are entering an era in which effective obesity treatments exist for the first time. Prevention efforts that address all of the factors that contribute to obesity must be bolstered, not abandoned, uh, to ensure that next generation will not require um, lifelong medication to maintain metabolic health. So 
I give the first part of the introduction mainly to highlight that this is a complex problem. Uh, we can't just tell patients to eat less and exercise more. It's just not, you know, you have to know more about how to deliver that whole thing. And even though we have these drugs that we uh, have to look at um, the long term consequences of trying to use them. So. I went on to the next thing, which is the newest thing um, that has come about um, from last two weeks ago, I think, from the New England Journal, uh, Rutartrotide, which is a uh, triple agonist, which is related to glucagon. So thought I will talk about 100 years of glucagon and 100 more. You know? <laughs> so um, you know, everybody knows about the discovery of insulin and all this stuff in uh, 1921. Uh, but a year later, you know, Kimball and uh, Marlin, they tried to replicate this. And what they found was when they injected the pancreatic extract, the first thing that happened was the glucose went up. You know, So they said, oh, there's something, you know, we, they found something else. You know, So they uh, called this factor glucose agonist uh, and for short glucagon. You know, so over the uh, three decades, the hormone status was not generally accepted, you know, but several groups have explored the possible mechanisms and, you know, use different terminologies. And you can see here, you know, this is the timeline from 1922 to uh, 2023. So you can see here the discovery of glucagon and there was a long gap. Um, and then glucagon was purified and crystallized. The alpha cell identified as the secretory origin. Then we had the first glucagon uh, assay that was developed uh, in 1959, shortly after uh, insulin assay was developed. Then you know uh, they uh, you know uh, found that there was hyperglucagonemia in diabetes, and then that um, antagonism of the glucagon re receptor shows. Uh, reduced hyperglycemia and diabetes. And then, of course, you know, the dual agonist was first in 2019, and then now the triple agonist, um, which was in 2023. And then also the establishment of the liver alpha cell axis. So glucagon, um, you know, even to this day, for most of us, other than writing a prescription for GWOC or, you know, one of these uh, glucagon preparations, you know, we don't pay too much attention to it. We don't use it as a drug. We don't have it, but uh, it is quite uh, interesting, important and um, key regulator of energy metabolism. This is just the same thing, but this looks at are the alpha cell. Uh, and the glucagon and milestones of discovery, just to say that the alpha cell itself was uh, identified only in 1907. And uh, glucagon uh, purified uh, form uh, isolated in 1948, you know, and the localization of glucagon to the alpha cell was in 1962. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a series of things that looking at it and, uh, you know, it took them quite a long time to look at the human uh, alpha cell, single cell transcriptomics, looking at the regulation of um, glucagon uh, secretion and uh, how, you know, what it does. So one of the problems was that glucagon, unlike insulin, has, you know, has a family of uh, proteins. The, the pro-glucagon molecule uh, has, you know, this glycogen related polypeptide, you have glucagon, you have major glucagon fragments, you have glucagon 1 to 61, you have glycentin, oxyntomodulin. So they're all very similar. So trying to develop an assay that would measure one and not the other, and because these uh, all of these gut hormones are made uh, in the gut and secreted into the portal vein and in, into the circulation, uh, it, you know, th the the data initially was very conflicting and people had to be sure that what they were measuring was pure glucagon and not something else. So it really took some uh, time. And um, the, uh, the the regulation uh, was more difficult to study because of the way, um, how it responds and uh, how different hormones that are related respond. And also because glucagon acts both through the glucagon receptor and also through the GLP-1 receptor. So um, its effects are 
uh, more uh, varied. So this is the proglucagon molecule, the pancreatic cells. Um, they, you know, process uh, mainly um, making glucagon and the larger glucagon one, um, one to sixty-one. Whereas in the enteroendocrine cells, you have the other proteins, uh -huh. glycentin, GLP-1, GLP-2, and IP-2, and oxindomodulin. Um, so these are two different sizes. So it depends on which proenzyme con convertase is. Um, there. So if there is more of PC2, less of PC1, you'll get these. Uh, if you have more PC1 and less PC2, you're going to get um, the other uh, set of uh, hormones. So the regulation of glucagon secretion, uh, again, is through you know, different things. One is, of course, um, um, is through glucose, but there is also the role of insulin. Um, which um, itself can cause an uh, uh, inhibition of glucagon uh, secretion. You know? um, so it has, uh, uh, sorry, you know, stimulating glucagon secretion. So you have, uh, uh, and then it also works through um, GLP-1 receptors. So there are several drugs such as GLP-1 analogs, HGLT-2 inhibitors, and, you know, uh, neprilysin inhibitors. They also modulate by you know, direct or indirect mechanisms. So there are multiple ways uh, by which uh, glucagon is uh, regulated uh, and uh, secreted um, uh, within the normal you know, human person. It acts, uh, as I mentioned, through both the glucagon uh, uh, receptor, which is a classic uh, G protein coupled uh, receptor, uh, and also um, it has uh, some signaling through the GLP-1 uh, uh, receptors, um, which uh, all add to their overall uh, regulation. So what are the stimulators of um, um, glucagon secretion? Hypoglycemia, uh, protein meal, amino acids, fatty acids. You know. And then you have, um, th these are the metabolic uh, stimulators. Then you have stress cold exposure, parasympathetic nervous system, and sympathetic uh, nerves, they all uh, regulate uh, increased uh, glucagon secretion. Then you have a whole series of hormones, including adrenaline, cholecystokinin, um, uh, gastrin-releasing peptide, ghrelin, uh, you have um, oxytocin, vasopressin, and BIP. Uh, they all uh, are stimulators. And then you have inhibitors, which are um, hyperglycemia or glucose, carbohydrate, meal, uh, non-essential fatty acids. Um, then you have ketones, then uh, ATP, GABA, and zinc, uh, insulin, uh, amylin, GLP-1, leptin, certain, and somatostatin all inhibit uh, uh, secretion of uh, glucagon. So there are multiple uh, regulators of um, uh, the glucagon secretion. And within the islet itself, the uh, alpha cells uh, interact with the beta cells and the delta cells. And uh, there is, um, you know, uh, a regulation uh, within each islet of the secretion of, uh, of glucagon. So uh, it has a very complex uh, mechanism uh, to maintain uh, normal glucagon levels. Now, there are opposite effects of glucagon and insulin on different uh, physiologic processes, like glucagon will increase you know, um, glycemia, whereas insulin decreases, glycogenolysis, uh, gluconeogenesis, glycolysis, lipolysis, lipogenesis, amino acid turnover, ketogenesis. You can see all of them, they have uh, opposite effects you know, um, for, of uh, each other. The physiologic actions of glucagon, um, the, in preclinical studies, you have decreased appetite, increased cardiomyocyte survival, decreased glucose uptake in the muscle, visceral adipose tissue increases lipolysis, brown adipose tissue increases thermogenesis. In the liver, uh, it does increase uh, hepatocyte survival. In clinical studies, uh, decreased food intake, increased heart rate, uh, decreased gastric emptying, decreased peristaltic motility, increased resting energy expenditure, increased GFR, 
uh, hepatic glucose output, ureogenesis, uh, lipid oxidation are all increased and it decreases lipid synthesis. So these are the physiologic effects that you see um, in humans. And this is a very interesting thing because uh, one of the first things that was done when looking at uh, glucagon as a drug was to use it in fatty liver disease. And uh, that was based on some of the physiology that looked at um, the effect of um, um, alpha cells on the liver and the liver on the alpha cells, what is called the liver alpha cell axis. So um, glucagon secreted from the A cells um, acts in a feed feedback axis on glucose, amino acid, lipid metabolism via the glucagon receptor here on hepatocytes. Um, the, they modulate the, in turn uh, what happens to glucagon uh, secretion. So that um, glucagon stimulates amino acid transport and ureogenesis, resulting decreased circulating concentration of amino acids, reduces glucagon secretion as amino acids uh, stimulate glucagon secretion. So glucagon increases hepatic beta oxidation, decreases lipogenesis, lowering the circulating concentration of free fatty acids. So in metabolic disease, you know, what happens is that there is hyperglucagonemia, which then leads to a series of um, problems of having more. Um, so in this case, the when the amino acids do not enter the urea cycle due to glucagon resistance, so, um, so just like insulin resistance, there is glucagon resistance uh, in metabolic uh, syndrome. That leads to, um, you know, increased circulating levels of amino acids. Then hepatic steatosis leads to decreased expression of hepatic amino acid transporters, preventing hepatic amino acid uptake. And circulating amino acids serve as messengers to alpha cells of the pancreas and increase glucagon secretion. So there is this visual vicious cycle, which then leads to hyperglucagonemia. So hyperglucagonemia in turn um, causes, you know, a you know, decreased beta oxidation, increased lipogenesis. So there's more fat in the liver. There's increased glycogenolysis and increased gluconeogenesis. Um, so all of which causes an increase in uh, higher amounts of glucose. Uh, and then, of course, you know, changes in amino acid metabolism. Uh, there's also a decreased clearance um, uh, that can be seen um, uh, if there is a reduction in uh, renal function. So there are multiple pathways by which hyperglucagonemia actually worsens the uh, problem of um, uh, hepatic uh, steatosis. So then, so what should we do if we want to use this to our benefit? So the, if you do, um, you know, glucagon agonism, it will increase hepatic glucose output, increase amino acid catabolism, actually will decrease uh, hepatic fat content and um, increase hepatic lipid oxidation, decrease li hepatic lipogenesis. And then you have you know, blood pressure and uh, increased cardiac um, inotropy. Then you have increased insulin secretion, decreased food intake, increased energy um, expenditure and decreased gastric emptying. Antagonism, of course, would have the opposite effects, uh, decreasing hepatic glucose output and decreasing A1C. And in the pancreas, of course, you know, alpha cell hyperplasia, uh, beta cell proliferation, uh, increased uh, body weight, and increased liver transaminases. So the, the net effect, you know, uh, hyperglycemia contributes to hyperglycemia and the, the liver alpha cell axis encompasses um, glucagon's effect on glucose, lipid, and amino acids. Glucagon agonism rather than antagonism shows promise. This was what they wrote way back in 2008 or 9. So then um, it also has an effect on appetite regulation. So it does control food intake. Um, this is the neuronal pathways by which it works on the hypothalamus and the arcuate nucleus uh, and acts mainly through the AGRP, uh, agouti-related protein um, peptides, you know, so it does decrease uh, food intake and it also has an effect on increasing uh, energy expenditure um, and also 
It has increased lipolysis, decreased lipogenesis, increased ketogenesis through its effects on white adipose tissue. Through this uh, sympathetic nervous system, it would have an effect on brown adipose tissue and uh, increased thermogenesis. So the net effect uh, is going to be a decrease in body weight. So um, there were some studies uh, starting in the 1950s to try and see uh, if um, glucagon has any thermogenic effects. So right up to you know now, um, the studies have not been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, there are some studies that show that it is, and most of the studies are uh, probably not uh, as conclusive. However, you know, um, the mechanism that is postulated um, is that with uh, glucagon, um, there is a, you know, as I mentioned before, that, you know, there is some increase in the direct nervous system activity uh, with more um, brown adipose tissue and at the level of the, uh, white adipose tissue, and that there is a increase in energy expenditure, uh, which favors weight loss. So these are different glucagon related, uh, I mean, glucagon, um, uh, you know, uh, agonists that have been developed. So this is the original glucagon. Uh, it is highly specific, poor solubility, poor stability. Then you have the modified glucagons, which are, um, you know, range from, you know, this is a dual peptide, which is bispecifically for GLP-1 and G uh, and glucagon receptor. Then you have the triple peptide, uh, tri-specificity, um, balanced agonism, enhanced solubility, enhanced stability, and extended uh, half-life. Um, this one has an extended half-life. Um, so, so there are different um, uh, forms of glucagon that have been developed. And this is what you could expect with monoagonists and polyagonists. So what will happen if you have glucagon, uh, monoagonists, um, then you have, you know, this is glucagon, GIP, and GLP-1, uh, polyagonists, which are GIP, uh, GLP, -C, um, glucagon, and the triple, which is GLP, GIP, and glucagon. So what you will find is an increase in insulin sensitivity, increase in leptin sensitivity, uh, decreased body weight, decreased food intake, increased lipolysis, thermogenesis, um, and the only thing that is different from all these different ones and glucagon alone is that with glucose, um, glucagon will raise glucose, whereas none of the others will actually raise the glucose levels. So this was the first dual agonist uh, that was developed. This was a phase 1B trial that was done. Uh, this was done in China, uh, and it was called mazutidide or something like that. You know? so, and you can see here the change in body weight that occurred with, uh, this is placebo. This is the 10, uh, uh, this is the 9 milligram dose and the 10 milligram dose. So you can see uh, that there is a decrease in body weight. This was not uh, developed at this point, not fully uh, developed. Um, then you have this uh, publication that was published last month um, on August 10th. So this is a triple uh, agonist. Um, so this is a phase two double blind randomized uh, placebo control trial. Um, and it had, so this is the effect that you can see with the different doses. So this is a 48 week study. And what you find here, which is most dramatic compared to most other uh, drugs that we have, is that if you want a 15 percent, uh, more than 15 percent weight loss was seen in 83 percent of individuals who took this drug and more than 30 percent and more than a quarter of individuals got this drug. So that is bariatric surgery type weight loss, 30 percent. Uh, weight reduction. So there was a huge amount and more than 25% was almost 50% at the uh, highest dose, which is 12 milligrams, you know. So it has a, a huge effect on uh, body weight uh, and you can see their chain, you know, uh, of course, the higher the BMI, the greater was the percent change in the body weight, which is common for all of these uh, studies that you have. F women lost more weight than men um, in this uh, study. 
So uh, <clears throat> there was substantial reduction. The most common adverse effect were gastrointestinal. Uh, these were dose related, were mostly mild to moderate in severity and were partially mitigated with a lowering of the dose. So the dose uh, dependent increase in heart rate peaked at 24 weeks and declined thereafter. So it has had a significant impact. Um, I mean, this particular triple uh, drug, I mean, obviously is going through more studies to be able to develop. So this is something that um, will be, um, you know, studied in more detail and see where it goes in terms of overall thing. So I'll summarize it, but obesity is a complex disease with many different causes. Uh, new understanding of potential causes of obesity may lead to better approaches to long-term prevention and mitigation of the obesity uh, epidemic. Now, glucagon has several actions that could help in body weight regulations and clinical trials of long-term safety and efficacy are ongoing. So I'll end my talk here and welcome any questions. Thank you. So for people who are on uh, online, um, the microphone, the uh, the microphones, your, your microphones won't be working. So if you have a question, you can type it in in the chat. Any questions? Yes. No. Can we give like the glucagon because it's increasing the numbers? Can we give it to the right? So when they have given used it in people, these were obesity studies, so they were not diabetic. They were not. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have studied it. The the net result, I mean, unless you have uh, way out of control diabetes, you know, the net effect uh, because uh, of its uh, effect on GLP-1 receptor, because these are triple agonists, so um, that they end up being actually lowering the blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Yes. It seems that uh, uh, we talked about cognitive, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I noticed like a lot of ads in the fast food places, and they show a sandwich with all the stuff in it, and that immediately turns me off. But obviously, it must turn most people on, or they wouldn't do it, right? They must have correct. A lot of in fact, information that says it does. Yes. So uh, that is, in fact, you know, there, there are studies that have looked at uh, fMRIs on individuals um, showing these kinds of pictures and looking at how they will respond, you know, between obese individuals, people who, and then they have the eating questionnaires and all of those things. And certainly um, people respond differently and it can be tracked to, and you can show from those studies that, um, you know, their eating behavior and how they respond to this picture, you know, um, will be uh, will correlate, you know. So uh, yes, I mean, if you are turned off by it, then then that's why you're not obese. <laughs> you know? well, uh, you but it's one that I know about that. So correct, you know. You know, but most people don't. So yeah, I mean, that is one. I mean, but it's it's more complicated than that because you know, the, what turns some people on and off, or you know, is, is something different you know so uh so that's why yes it does have a significant uh, part to that you know so mm -hmm. the other question i wonder about and I'm, i i imagine there's not any or very little information is that one of the effects of the diet drugs uh are to reduce appetite mm -hmm. and i wonder then if the appetite is reduced uh, which kind of foods are all foods turned off or, or so, no? Actually, they do have a tendency. Right, they have. In fact, they do have um, an effect on higher energy foods that they turned off. You know, and interestingly, for the GLP ones, it also uh, lowers. Um, you know, ap uh, you know, uh, 
any you know, uh, alcohol and you know, it will decrease craving for alcohol you know so um, so there are more than one uh, thing that it will affect and and in and with the triple agonets um there is also an increase in energy expenditure you know um, so with with these drugs there is an increase in energy expenditure too so there is both a decrease in appetite and uh, increase in energy expenditure so uh, so there's a question here about um how do you convince a person to go on a weight loss program? Um, well, I think uh, the, the main thing would be to talk to them about the thing and persistently and explain why they need to do that. It may take several um, visits and uh, there are ways to try and gradually nudge someone to, uh, you know, the, the, the response to your initial um, approach may be somewhat you know persistence but over time you can convince uh, most people to do some sort of a diet and then there are other ways there by which uh, we can uh, help them go through a, a program for for weight loss you know and um, could the study of Prederville syndrome give us any insights um, well, Prader Willi, I mean, so the monogenic obesities are a separate thing altogether because um, most obesity is polygenic, you know. Um, so in, in some of these diseases where there is a specific gene that is defective and that causes the um, weight gain, uh, then, uh, you know, we can target it. Like the, the one drug that is now available is the smet melanotide. Uh, which is uh, for those with Lawrence Moon Beetle syndrome. So there, you know, it is uh, addressing the MC4R gene, and you know, you you can use that drug uh, for that mutation. So uh, you can use some of these uh, which are targeted uh, to a specific mutation, but they are the minority. So in the majority of patients, uh, we're not going to find it. But of course, you know, um, the hope is that if we know the full spectrum of what all genes are involved. Uh, maybe we can develop individual drugs, but um, it'll be pretty expensive to give so many people targeted uh, drugs. You know? So, um, yes, there is a, certainly a strong genetic predisposition to obesity. Uh, uh, it is polygenic though. The most uh, common types of obesity are polygenic, but there are a number of genes that are uh, linked to this. And then there are the less common uh, monogenic uh, obesities where you have a single gene defect um, that can lead to obesity. Okay. Thank you.